Over the summer of 2022, I had the immense privilege and pleasure of visiting the Museo del Synth Marchigiano, which is the most comprehensive collection of rare and obscure vintage Italian synthesizers on the planet. This video is an account of what I experienced there. So let's start old, really old, 1964 old. So this is the Sinket, and uh, my friend Heinbach has just done a wonderful video specifically on this synthesizer, and he did a whole album with it, which I thoroughly recommend you go and check out. But for the purposes of this video, in a nutshell, Paolo Ketoff was an engineer who was working for RCA in Rome, uh, and he'd had some experience with building... Uh, bespoke pieces of equipment and inspired by the work of Harold Boder, he thought he'd have a crack at a synthesizer and the result was the Synkit, the name being a portmanteau of synthesizer and Ketoff. Now this is 64, uh, Bob Moog is building the first Moog modular at this point, I think Don Buchler started making modules a year later, uh, although they weren't even called Buchler modules at that point, so this is a really interesting point in synth history, or synth prehistory, you could almost say. Um, and Ketoff's idea was that this synthesizer would be portable, and you could use it on stage or in the studio. And American composer John Eaton uh, used a sync kit comprehensively for many years, um, as did Linda Walker Pointer. Um, in terms of studio use, it appeared in a lot of Italian movie soundtracks, notably by none other than Ennio Morricone, which I thought was awesome. I was really stoked to find that out. Um, so uh, a really unusual synthesizer. They made eight or nine, something like that. And of the surviving examples, uh, I think there are two in museums. And then there's this one that is working that you can record with. Uh, so crazy rare. And for me, it just exudes a sense of voltage. Um, you know, I'm so acutely aware that I was manipulating electricity and um, it's the way it fizzes and hums and buzzes and pulses and crackles. It's just a very unique experience which is different to later synthesizers which are more conformed.
So let's get groovy. This is the Echo Computer Rhythm. Now, I knew the Echo name from their guitars because a couple of mates had Echo Acoustics in the 90s, but I knew very little of their electronic instruments. And this is an analog drum machine with a digital programmable sequencer, a 16-step sequencer, no less, from 1972. And Roland and Lynn Electronics get the lion's share of the credit for the popularity of drum machines, and arguably rightly so. But really, the guys at Echo were doing a lot of that stuff many years before. This is eight years before the TR-808 and six years before the CR-78 and uh, seven years before the Lynn LM-1. So... Uh, how is this not better known? Well, probably because it was on a tiny scale, relatively. They made 40 or 50 of them. And it did have some famous use. Um, Jean-Michel Jarre had one, uh, and it appears in a couple of his videos, particularly that video where he keeps doing the thing with the head. You know this. Yes. And also German pioneer Manuel Gotching uh, and Tangerine Dream. But really, it was on a very small scale compared to Roland and Lynn. One of the awesome things about it is the way that you can load sounds from punch cards. And it loads instantaneously. <laughs> I don't think drum machines work that well now, uh, which is uh, kind of bonkers. Um, but it sounds absolutely fantastic and um, one of the coolest things is you can do odd time signatures with it like this familiar with the story of the Chamberlain and the subsequent Mellotron, which were amongst the first ever sample-based instruments, although they weren't called that at the time. And those employed uh, magnetic tape. And when you press the key, the piece of tape associated with that key would play back. Now, in the late 60s, a company called the Optigan Corporation uh, developed an alternative way of doing something similar using optical discs with the different sounds recorded on the concentric tracks of an optical disc. And that instrument was also called the Optigan, as in optical organ. Now, the company that owned Optigan were Mattel, who were a toy company, and it was marketed as a kind of home product slash novelty product. And it's only in more recent years that it's developed a cult following and the sounds of it particularly the loops that were recorded with anonymous session musicians in the late 60s and early 70s appear in lots of different pop records, uh, in loads of TV commercials and movie soundtracks. Now, in a way that mirrors the infamous relationship between the Mellotron and the earlier Chamberlain, uh, something similar happened in the optical disc world, which was that Frederick Roy Chilton, uh, who I believe had been involved with Mattel and possibly even the Optigan, um, developed a rival product called the Chilton Talent Maker, which on the face of it is the same thing. Uh, and apparently the Optigan guys brought legal action uh, 
against the Chilton talent maker. And I don't know what the result of that was, but the talent maker did make it out into the world. And what on earth is the link between this and Italy? Well, uh, production of the talent maker was taken up by General Electro Music, Gem, who are an Italian company, which is why you sometimes hear this referred to as the Italian Optagon. <laughs> Now, a little cultural tidbit for you. So John Bryan used the Chilton Talent Maker, specifically a disc called Guitar in 4-4, all over the soundtrack for Eternal Sunshine of a Spotless Mind. And he would press down two of the accompaniment keys at a time and get this beautiful polytonal effect. And with the really wobbly, warbly, crunchy uh, sound quality of this weird old instrument, um, it just works brilliantly uh, in the film, especially with the subject matter. Now, the very first video you will find on my channel is a recreation of one of the cues from Eternal Sunshine of a Spotless Mind, explaining and demonstrating exactly what he did. Uh, and so it's really cool to be able to, after all these years, feature the actual talent maker. <laughs> Okay, so Krumar is a brand that I've definitely heard of. It's the one Italian manufacturer that I've come across the most in the UK. Your experiences may differ. Um, and I recognise many of the Krumars there at the museum, but they also had some really obscure ones, which I had definitely not heard of. And that synth you just heard was the Krumar Compact Synth from 1976, and it's a real oddball. So it's set up with the controls below the keyboard so that you would put it on top of an organ. And in terms of its sound and the way it behaves, it feels like it can't decide whether it is a synth or a monophonic organ, which makes sense because that kind of clash and tension was what was going on at the time. A really weird little thing. And unfortunately, I got that one recording and then it started playing up. And so I didn't get another usable recording, but hopefully uh, that one recording gives you a little taste of what it's about. Uh, talking of obscure Krumars, here's another. So this is the Dynamic Piano, or DP50, and this is an electronic piano. The sounds are synthesized, uh, and they run through two filters in series, and you can control the two uh, filter cutoffs, but you then have dynamic control of the filter cutoffs, which you can set up very precisely, and it works really well, and it's quite a beautiful sound. And apparently the Krumar DP, Either this one or one of the others, there were a couple of them, uh, was used by Radiohead, which wouldn't surprise me. So 
Yes. So Elka is another brand I've definitely heard of because of since like the Elka Rhapsody. But this is one I definitely hadn't heard of, the Elka Twin 61. So named because you can set up two sounds, twin sounds on it. But the thing about this synth that was really killer was the phaser. I'm an absolute sucker for phase shifters. I love the phase shifters on the System 100M. And so, um, I, yeah, I just phased the day away. Now, another Elka that was in the studio is one that has been on my bucket list for years, and I was so glad I got to play one and I was not disappointed. And that is the flipping Synthex. So this is the Ferrari polysynth of the early 80s from Italy and it was brought out to do battle with the Oberheims and Prophets and Jupiters of the world and it does a very good job of that but then it also includes a bunch of things that those synths don't, in particular the multi-mode filters uh, and a four track sequencer which unfortunately wasn't working on the particular unit I used but it's a, it's a really beautiful full and rich but kind of melancholy sound and um I, I just instantly fell in love with it i would adore one i'm very unlikely to ever own one uh thank goodness cherry audio just uh, did a software version of it hey um so yeah i was really chuffed to finally play that synth So CRB, you know, you get a CRB form when you're working with kids and stuff. Well, those guys also made synthesizers, apparently. And one of them's called the Oberon. 
And if you see a synth with Oberon written on it, obviously you have to play it. And I was not disappointed. It, In some ways it was conventional, but in other ways it was definitely not. So it's got uh, multi-mode filters, low pass, a band pass, high pass, and then all pass, which means no filter. Uh, it's also got things like, instead of pulse width modulation and pulse width, it has a uh, duty cycle pulse height and pulse width. And then it has another tone generation source called AM, and we couldn't, for the life of us, figure out what that was. Amplitude modulation? Audio modulation? I don't know. But it seemed to be some kind of combination of the main two voltage controlled oscillators. And it gave you a series of selectable um, overtones and harmonics, which you could blend in to fill out the sound even more. <laughs> Another CRB, this is the Voco Strings, which I think was probably brought out to compete with things like the VP330 because it's a string machine and a vocoder. Hello, editor here. So I recorded the vocoder, but I didn't quite grasp how it works. It was a bit unconventional. Um, and when I got home, the recording was unfortunately unusable. Um, so here's a vocoded apology. of this CRB synths I'm going to show you. Now, Jupiter is famously a Roman god, but ironically, it wasn't the Italians who got to make a famous Jupiter synth. It was the Japanese. So instead, uh, the Italians turned their attention to Uranus. Finished? Okay. Now, I've always wanted to go on Uranus, and uh, I've never had access to Uranus before, but as I press my fingers... No, this is getting too weird, isn't it? Um, really cool synthesizer. It, it's kind of a Jupiter 4, isn't it? But not at the same time. Um, and yeah, really enjoyable to play. <laughs>
So I just wanted to play you a couple more of these kind of multi timbre instruments that were famous all over the world. The, you know, the kind of brass strings synthesizer affairs like the Roland RS-505 or the Yacht Quadra or the Korg Trident. And um, yeah, these uh, they just have a really melancholy sound to them. They're just really haunting and, and beautiful. And, you know, they're, they're all about layering the parts together once when they really come to life. And um you could lose hours playing around with these things. It just sounds so beautiful. Now this is uh, that synthesizer Tom Hanks used in uh, Castaway. Wilson! No, I will not apologize for that joke. So this is another monosynth that sounds like it wants to be an organ <laughs> or something. Very strange, but kind of conventional in some ways. Um, and it's got a big button on it called random music that flashes at you. And it's got like a an illustration of some kind of planets orbiting and stuff. <laughs> and uh, yeah. Now the Keytech CTS 2000. <laughs> there were so many synths called the something 2000 because obviously that was the future uh, a very long time ago. Uh, and this is a totally 80s synth, um, you know, with cartridges to load your sound and everything. And I, I wanted to play a little bit of this just to demonstrate that, you know, whilst we're aware of perhaps now the 60s and 70s Italian synths, they did, of course, carry on into the 80s and into the 90s. Uh, and they were not immune to the effects of the Yamaha DX7 and the Roland D50. And you can really hear it with this key tech. So to finish up, a world exclusive. Uh, the guys had been donated a one-of-a-kind product called the Baliani Solista, which had been designed by Egidio Marchetti. Sorry if I've butchered the pronunciation of that. Uh, and what this is, is an audio accompaniment unit, which those kind of things were popular at the time. Um, and it had been made by, you know, putting together Frankensteining parts from other products to make something that was 
analog, but with a digital control, I assume, because it follows whatever you do. And I got the pleasure of being the one who got to turn it on to see if it actually still worked. And it kind of did, but the bass section was like 80% noise and 20% bass. So we turned that off because it sounded horrible. So you didn't get the full sound, but with the drums and the other parts of the accompaniment, it, it did work. Um, and so there we go, the bizarre, one-of-a-kind Baliani Solista. made it this far thank you for watching it's um it's like an alternative universe isn't it where everything was kind of similar but different at the same time which is wonderful um an enormous thank you to everyone at the museum in particular paolo and ricardo who put themselves out in many ways and were extraordinarily generous to myself and my family while we visited so thank you uh, i hope i can return the favor at some point i'll leave you with the sounds of the baliani solista thanks everyone 